It was 30 years ago when I was a young kid growing up in Oakland, California, when I popped a cassette tape of the 1990 release from Bishop Hezekiah Walker and the Love Fellowship Crusade Choir. This classic gospel album is called By Any Means Necessary. And on the cover of the album, if you go and research it, you'll see Hezekiah Walker wore a bright yellow sports coat on the album cover. So today, my attire is my nod to Bishop Hezekiah Walker. When I reach the second to last song on the B side of this cassette tape, I heard a piano coming through sounding mighty churchy and then the organ came in and backed it up a little bit, and then I heard Bishop Walker, and he said, uh, Lord, I'm running, trying to make a hundred. Ninety-nine and a half won't do. do, 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 do. Lord, I'm running, trying to make a hundred. Ninety-nine and a half won't do. Ninety-nine, nine, nine, nine. You know what I'm talking about. If you've heard the song, that was nostalgic. If you've never heard it, I recommend you go listen to it. It was ahead of its time. This was 30 years ago, and that song still hits today. Immediately, I was hooked. I believe Hezekiah Walker is arguably the king of black church choir music because he made stuff that any church choir could sing on a Sunday morning. I love Kirk Franklin. I love Fred Hammond. I love Ricky Dillard and John P. Key. I love Richard Smallwood and Donald Lawrence. But the greatness of Hezekiah Walker is the accessibility of his music. Anybody could sing his songs. And I loved singing this particular song. You know what, Hezekiah Walker, he makes songs that are so catchy that it gets to a point where you stop liking the song. You know what I'm talking about? Where like, you hear a song so much and when you first heard it was like, oh man, this is hidden. You know what I'm saying? Every praise is due our God. Every word of worship, right? And we all jamming. And then about the 700th time, you hear the song, it's like, okay, can we sing something else? That's the type of stuff that Hezekiah Walker made and still makes. 99 and a half is one of those songs, but as I've grown, I've discovered how much of our theology is transmitted through music. Some of you who are worshiping with us today are going to remember more what you heard from Mariel singing than you hear from my preaching. I've actually preached in places where people came up to me after worship and complimented me on the song I sang before the sermon and said nothing about the sermon that I preached. I was lightweight offended, but you know, we're not gonna get into that today. But that's why we sing God music at the faith community because we believe that it's more important that we're focused on the message in the music regardless of the genre. So I had to ask myself as I reflected on this song, what is the message in this song? What kind of theology does this song convey? The reality is that much like the writers of scripture, the writer of 99 and a half won't do leaves much up to our interpretation. And I believe we have embraced this song through a dangerous interpretive lens. Some of us have subconsciously internalized this song as a challenge to always get it right. We live out this song as a charge to be certain. We embrace this song as a mandate to be morally superior 100% of the time because anything less is insufficient. But I'm not sure 
That's what Hezekiah Walker meant when he recorded it. It's actually evident in the lyrics. If you go listen to it, he says in the first verse, on my knees every day, Lord, please hear me when I pray. Please forgive me. Listen, when I stumble, Lord, I want to be in the number. Hezekiah recognizes that we can stumble and still be in the number. But somehow Christians tend to get self-righteous about everyone else's shortcomings, but not our own. And if someone dares to point out our shortcomings, we strike it down as blasphemy or heresy or trying to tear down the faith. We sometimes treat people as if missing the mark of perfection in their conduct disqualifies them from relationship and fellowship with God because 99 and a half won't do. We've been formulating our theology around teaching people about conduct rather than showing people how to care. But the concern of the song is not merely your conduct, but rather your character. Listen to me here. You can cover poor character with good conduct. I want to say that one more time because that's tweetable. You can cover poor character with good conduct. We've seen it time and time again. Somebody who is a philanthropist in public, but a molester in private. We've seen people who have been kind and approachable in public, but they've been abusive in private. You can cover poor character with good conduct, but good character always results in caring conduct. We, we've seen all the people who act one way in their social media posts until their circumstances change and then all of the sudden they're not who they post to be. But even then, there is hope for all of us to be included in the number. That's the focus of Jesus' words in the text before us. He's giving instruction about who's included in and excluded from the kingdom of heaven based on how they handle the law. I know that sounds like an imposing topic, but stick with me. I promise you I'm going somewhere. This text is so packed with preaching possibility that I think it's important to tell you what I'm not going to unpack in this message. Number one, I'm not going to give you an entire discourse on the law. Books have been written on what scriptures mean when they refer to the law, and we still have not come down to a consensus yet. Some suggest it's the Ten Commandments. Others suggest it's all the laws given to Moses. Some others suggest it includes the Levitical codes. Many faith traditions have created their own version of the law. I'm not trying to prove that point today, but for the sake of today's discussion, let's just agree to an understanding of the law as the general rules of our faith tradition. Whether you're Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Episcopal, Pentecostal, holiness, etc. For the sake of this message, the law represents the rules of your faith tradition. Number two, what I'm not going to do today is attempt to provide any certainty on what Jesus means by the kingdom of heaven. Some people suggest that Jesus is referring to the afterlife when he says kingdom of heaven. Others suggest he is referring to the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. As he said in the model prayer in Matthew 6, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
I'm not here to argue what Jesus means when he refers to the kingdom of heaven. But I do believe that when it comes to heaven, answering the question how is more important than answering when and where. Jesus provides some clarity for us because he wants us to know that our inclusion in the kingdom of heaven whether in this life or the next is not based on whether or not we get everything right but if we can admit when we get some things wrong and since church folk are so committed to our rules let's discuss how Jesus identifies our place in the kingdom of heaven based on our relationship to the rules. He provides three distinct groups of people in this passage to let us know that sometimes 99 and a half will do. If you look at the text, there's the first group there and first in verse 19, I like to call this group the practical. Look at the text, it's crazy what Jesus says right here. This is the most misunderstood group of them all. He says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom. If you break any of them, just one, it doesn't have to be some laundry list of errors, just one, you are the least. If you mess up, you're the least. If you fall short, you're the least. If you get off track, you're the least. If you go to the wrong places, you're the least. If you eat the wrong thing, drink the wrong thing, smoke anything, you are the least. Here's the kicker though. We tend to overlook the most important word in this phrase. We get stuck on the word least, but the most important word in the phrase is just two letters, I, in. In the kingdom. We may be the least, but more importantly, we get in. I call these people in this group the practical because they recognize we're practicing. In practice, errors are expected. In practice, you progress as you go. In practice, perfection is not required. In practice, I open myself to the grace of God when I fall short. Doctors practice medicine. Attorneys practice the law. What if Christians adopted the mindset that we are practicing faith? If that question made you uncomfortable, I want you to open yourself up to the practicality of your faith. You're uncomfortable because you've embraced the mentality that your faith is an exact science that requires certainty. So anything less than 100 won't do. But Jesus says, you can get one of the least of these commandments wrong and teach others to do the same and you will be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. Those who know me know how much I love Dave Chappelle. I really like when people can make me laugh and or make me think. Dave Chappelle does both of those masterfully for me. And I try to get tickets to see Dave Chappelle any chance that I get. Now, for most of the 20 teens, me and my wife Pamela barely had enough money to pay the light bill and go half on a fifth of cheap vodka. So, trying to buy tickets to go see Dave Chappelle was just not gonna happen for most of the 20 teens. 
But recently, we found out that Dave Chappelle was going to be here in Atlanta, and he was going to be doing a few shows, and Pamela and I jumped into a virtual ticket line before the tickets even went on sale. But obviously, we didn't get in that line early enough because by the time we got to the front of the line, we were confronted with a message that said, tickets are no longer available. Y'all, I was low key devastated. I haven't seen Dave Chappelle live since 2005. But it just so happens, I have a friend who has a good friend who is friends with Dave Chappelle. And that friend said to me, listen, let me see if I can talk to my friend and, and get you in the show because I know how much you want to get in. I said, yo, please. I was geeked at the idea of going to see Dave Chappelle live. My friend told me, now, I can't guarantee that I'm going to get you a good seat. Honestly, I can't even guarantee I'm going to get you a seat. But I'll try my best to get you in the building. So I responded, uh, you know what, no thanks. If I can't get the best seat in the house, then I don't want to go at all. Psych. That is not what I said. I said, bro, listen, I don't care if I got to stand next to the kitchen door. If you get me in the building to see Dave Chappelle, I'll be happy. I've been trying to score these tickets for years. Just get me in. Because there are some places I want to go where my position and my status don't matter. I just want to get in. You can give me good seats or you can give me no seats. I'll take standing room only if you can get me in. And I'm just wondering, are there any other people under the sound of my voice today who feel the same way about the kingdom of heaven? Whether it's heaven on earth or heaven in the hereafter, whether you call me the least or the greatest, I just want to get in. I want to be in God's presence where there is fullness of joy and at God's right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. I don't care if I'm first in line or last in line. Lord, just let me in. I know I haven't done everything right. And there were some times I made decisions where honestly, I didn't know if I was right or wrong. I was just doing the best with what I had. I don't need to hear God say, well done, my great and flawless servant. I just want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Somebody type in the comments, let me in, let me in, let me in. I don't care where you put me once I get in, but God, please let me in. Let me experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. Let me experience unspeakable joy. Let me feel your undying love. Let me feel the unending warmth of your embrace. Let me in. Because practical people know it's a privilege to get in. But then there's the second group in the text that I refer to not as the practical, but the perfect. Now, this is the ideal group. I mean, we all want to have good seats. We all want to be recognized as great at something. But Jesus says, in order to attain this status, perfection is required. If you want to be called the greatest in the kingdom, you can't mess up at all, all the way down to the most insignificant of the laws. You got to get them all right. If you mess up, your best bet is the least. To be considered great, perfection is required. Now, I can't speak for any of you, but I don't know anyone who fits this category. My mom is probably the closest. I really think highly of my mom. I think she's the closest to like being in this category, but I think she would testify. She's a long way away, and I believe she's the closest. So if you don't know anybody who fits into this perfection category, I want you to type me neither in the comments. 
because Jesus lays out the people in this group got to get it all right. One wrong and you're the least. None wrong and you're the greatest. What human being could that actually apply to? That's why 99 and a half will do sometimes because ain't none of us making a perfect score anyway. God is not concerned with your perfection. God just wants to see your progress. Jesus did not come to show us how to behave. He came to show us that we belong. When I was a kid, I was a pretty good student. I did my best to keep my grades up, but ninth grade was a tough year for me. If I could narrow it down to two reasons why it might have been a tough year, that was the first year I didn't play any competitive team sports. And then it was my first year in high school with all these young ladies with developed bodies and my brain just exploded so I could barely contain myself. But ninth grade was a tough year for me. I remember one semester I brought my grades home and my dad looked them over while simultaneously looking me over. Every grade on my report card was significantly lower than it was the year before. I'll never forget the question that my dad asked me. He said in his Mississippi Delta draw bubble, now, did you do your best? I was confused. Like, how am I supposed to respond to that? I wanted to lie and say yes, but I felt like that would get me into more trouble. So I just told him the truth. Yeah, nah, I really didn't do my best. And he said, that's why I'm disappointed about your grades. I don't care if you get A's and B's and everything. I don't expect you to excel in every subject. That's not realistic. But if you fart around and bring home a B, I'm going to be disappointed, not because you didn't get an A, but because you lacked effort. And if you give me your best effort and you bring home a C, I'm going to be proud. Could it be that's what Jesus is telling us in this text? Your effort determines your excellence. Your attitude is more important than your aptitude. And when you experience the kingdom of heaven in its fullness, it won't matter your status in the kingdom. You'll just be glad to be there. I remember the old saints talking about heaven and the hereafter, and they would say, you don't have to give me a mansion. I'll live on the streets in heaven if they're paved with gold. So Jesus lays out these two groups that he includes in the kingdom of heaven, the practical, a group that we can identify with, and the perfect, one that we can only dream of. But what's interesting to me is who he chooses to exclude. He says in verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus includes the practical and the perfect, but this statement suggests that he excludes the pretentious. He particularly names two pretentious groups, the scribes and Pharisees. Let me contextualize it the best way that I can. The scribes and the Pharisees are the people that Jesus goes to church with who act like they have everything together while they look down on the rest of us who are still working it out. The scribes and the Pharisees are the ones who can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. The scribes and Pharisees display proper conduct but really don't care about people. The scribes and the Pharisees are the ones who care more about keeping order than they do pursuing justice. 
The scribes and the Pharisees are the ones who condemn in public what they practice in private. They will publicly condemn you for the areas where you fall while privately they jump into the same mess. The scribes and Pharisees are the ones who will banish you to hell for breaking one of the least commandments while they completely ignore the greatest commandment. They are pretentious. In other words, they give off the appearance of being something that they are not. The pretentious are the ones who condemn the practical while presenting as if they're perfect. One more time in case you missed it, the pretentious are the ones who condemn the practical while presenting as if they are perfect. That's why Jesus says, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, I don't have time to go into a deep dive of all the nuances of the word righteousness. Join us for the Bible and beyond Saturdays at four here at the faith community. Just text the word disruptive th to, to 31996 if you want to take a deeper dive. But I can't do that in the time I have today. I just want to say this about righteousness. The reason Jesus warns against the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is because they are self-righteous. Their self-righteousness is characterized by an unfounded certainty that they are totally correct and morally superior. Here's the whole point of my message and I'm getting in my seat just a moment. Jesus is saying, getting it wrong does not exclude you from the kingdom. What excludes you from the kingdom of heaven is thinking that you're always right. One of the most productive activities a person of faith can engage in is the process of unlearning and relearning. It says, I have the humility to acknowledge I don't always get it right. But the self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees says, I got it all figured out. I don't need to unlearn anything. I don't need to re-examine anything. I don't need to question anything because I know I'm right. It was about 20 years ago living in San Diego, California, that my best friend Dante and I discovered that we had a real opportunity to play football at the collegiate level. Now we wanted to put ourselves in the best position possible to be ready, so we started lifting weights like crazy. Anywhere we could find a weight room, we were lifting. 24 hour fitness, LA fitness, the high school weight room, anytime fitness, the military bases in San Diego, wherever we could find a weight room. Well, one day we went to a different weight room for the first time. And I made my way over to the cable machine. Now, for those that don't know, to adjust the weight on a cable machine, there's a little pin in the middle of the weights. And you take that pin out and put it in another slot that coincides with the weight you want to lift. So if the pin is in 50, I take it out and I adjust it to go to 20. And that's how you adjust the weight on a cable machine. It pretty much works the same way everywhere you go. But this particular cable machine, I saw a warning right there next to the weights. And it warned you to secure the bar attached to the cable because when you pull out the pin, it releases all the suspension and the bar will come crashing down on your head if you don't hold it while you remove the pin. That was odd to me because usually that's not what happens, but I was glad I read the instructions. So I removed that pin while I held the bar and I felt all of the gravity shift when I took that pin out. And I was glad I read those instructions. I did my exercise, 
Then Dante came over from where he was, and he was about to do the same exercise I was just doing. And I saw him reaching for that pen. I said, Dante, wait, hold up. You should read that warning before you change that weight. Dante was like, nah, I got it. Don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing. I said, bro, wait. No, seriously, seriously, please, please read the instructions because you're going to mess around and hurt yourself. He was like, bro, leave me alone. I got it. I do this all the time. I know what I'm doing. Well, he didn't read those instructions. He didn't secure that bar. He just yanked that pen out, and that bar came crashing down on his head. Now, we eventually laughed about it, but I'm pretty sure he had a mild concussion. And what's interesting to me is that Dante got a concussion not because he didn't know how to read, but because he went into it thinking he already knew what to do. He went into it having the capacity to read but his attitude wasn't right. And that became his downfall. It wasn't his aptitude, it was his attitude. In the words of the problematic historical figure, Mark Twain, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And my friends, let me do my best to be practical because I know I'm not perfect and I don't want to risk being pretentious. I don't have it all figured out. Don't put that expectation on yourself. I don't always have the right answer. Don't put that expectation on yourself. I fall short sometimes. Give yourself the grace to do the same. Be okay with getting it wrong. Just don't fall into the trap of thinking you're always right. And in closing, in the words of Tiger Gibson, who just clowned me about my facial hair, I'm going to get you back, but you know it takes me time to think of my jokes. I'd like to call on the spirit of one of our ancestors, Mahalia Jackson and tell you that there are some things I may not know. There are some places I cannot go, but I am sure of this one thing, that God is real because I can feel him in my soul. Yes, God is real. Oh, God is real in my soul for he washed me and made me whole. Oh, his love for me is just like pure gold. Oh Lord, my God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. And I'm running, trying to make a hundred. And I'm grateful that the love of God says sometimes 99 and a half will do.